The really crazy piece is that if your mother was or your father was extra super abusive and abandonment abandoning, you will be attracted to extra super abusive abandoning dudes. If you feel lightning bolts, you're a perfect instrument. Your brain and body is a perfect instrument. So if you're lightning bolts attracted, I, I don't care what how that person presents, I guarantee you they will abandon and abuse eventually. First of all, I was a little nervous just coming on just because you're our first doctor and there's something about being around, my cousin's a doctor, I come from like a medical background, so there's something like comforting about it where I tend to overshare most cases, I'm sure you're used to this, especially <laughs> awesome, on a public platform, I'm like, oh man, am I going to overshare things that, because you know, my mom listens to this and people I know listen to this, so it's like, all right. I gotta, well, I gotta try to stay cool. Some, I think, in my opinion, it says something positive about you that you're able to go into that shared space of connecting and feel trusting, and it just happens to be on a public platform. Now you got to watch out for that. It's tougher, yeah, especially with a professional like yourself. I definitely feel more comfortable just being able to share that without feeling judged or anything like that. Uh, and I was, as I was going through the research, I was looking at your old episodes. I think it was like 1999, 1998 for Love Line with Adam Carolla. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just fascinated by the kind of questions and things that you were getting thrown at you. And from what right. I understand, you were also practicing doctor at that time actively, right? So this is something you were doing at night after. Yeah. Well, I, well I'm still practicing. But, but at, still that practicing, time, sorry. I, at that time, I was practicing a lot. I, I was getting up at five in the morning and struggling to get home at 10 at night. And and uh, Loveline sort of forced me to come home for dinner, and then I would go out and do this radio show late at night. Wow. And so it's because it, it's such a different world for what you were used to, because you rose on the top of the medical field, and then you decided to go into something that probably felt 180, although you were being yourself, you were still providing advice, but it was, yeah. you were put, being put in front of a camera, and you had so, to... So let me tell you the story. So, so this, maybe it'll make sense in historically. I think it'll make it's interesting. Right now, it makes more sense than ever. Mm. So here's what happened. It, it was it was, wasn't something I decided to do. It was something like I sort of got sucked into. Uh -huh. There was never a point I went, "Hey, I'm going to do this," or "I, I think I know what I'll do next." It's, to this day, I don't think that way. Um, at that point, it, let me take you all the way back to 1983. So I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm spending or yeah, 83, 84, yeah. And I'm spending all my time. I mean, back then, in if you're in training, you're working on AIDS. Uh, your your uh, AIDS, your AIDS oncology is filled with AIDS, infectious disease filled, with medicine filled. With AIDS. AIDS was everywhere. We were especially in county hospitals where I was training. And uh, I was. It was a deeply troubling time. I mean, it was a horrible story that there's really no one left to tell the tale except those of us that were working on the patients because the patients were all dead. I, I was there when they opened the boxes and pulled out the AZT and we were like, oh my God, we can do something. And we did and it worked. And it was sort of like remdesivir. Now, now I love the fact that we have the, a, a current model that helps people understand what it was like dealing with HIV and AIDS. So it, a, AZT was like remdesivir. It's like, we can do something. We can finally do something. Because at that point, all I was doing, people would come in the, with their first episode of pneumocystis, and I would sit them down and go, you have six months to live. And, and that was it. <laughs> that, that was the treatment. You have six months. Sorry. Um, and then we'd, we'd, we'd work around the edges dealing with all the, on, the, the oncological problems and, and you know, infections and things. But it, it wouldn't extend their life. It was ridiculous. Hmm. But AZT changed things. And, it, and then we had other antivirals. And it, so it was a proof of concept. You've heard Dr. Fauci talk about proof of concept with remdesivir. And it was it was thrilling at the time. So, and don't believe the Dallas Buyers Club movie. That is a massive distortion about what was going on at the time. And just, just remind mm. yourself that the, the evil AZT was bad for that particular case because he took 50 times the recommended dose and it suppressed his bone marrow. Of course, that's what happens. And not to say that AZT did much at the time. It did a little bit. It didn't. It, but we very quickly got into other things. And actually, the things like the Dallas Buyers Club got in the way of us being able to give people those medicines. There was uh, you you'll, you won't remember this history, but there was this um, 
rumor that AZT was causing AIDS and antivirals were much like the chip and Bill Gates and all the crazy rumors that are going around now. Do you heard these rumors about? The no, I haven't. Oh my God, there's so crazy rumors. Like, go go on the internet. Just look, look Bill Gates coronavirus vaccine, and you'll find. Oh, you're saying like he's keeping the vaccine from other people or something he, like that? He's, he wants the government wants to use the vaccine to inject a chip into us, and it's just all this craziness. Yeah. I can't. It's not true. The, <laughs> I can't even keep the the. Um, the delusions in, straight in my head. They're so bizarre. But yeah. same stuff was going on with AZT at the time. So here I am struggling, struggling, struggling. And a friend calls me out of the blue and goes, hey, you know, this radio station down the street. Where, where are you right now? Where do you live? Montreal, Quebec. Okay. Well, it, it, at that year, a radio station just uh, – you, you have to – Remember, radio back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was a massively, it was like social media today. It was a very important social instrument. And it was the sort of instrument of the youth. Uh, and people would gather, they, they, they would define themselves by what music they listened to, what radio station they listened to. There wasn't that many channels or, either, right? It was, it was like, no, there's only a few you can tune into. No, there were, the radio, there were a lot. Mm. But but if you watch like, um, what's... Uh, uh, the new movie with Bev, Brad Pitt and DiCra DiCaprio by uh, Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Radio, that was, you, you notice how radio was part of that story? Radio was, this Los Angeles was ground zero for radio. And at the time, this radio station, it never happened before. It came out of nowhere. It, it became popular overnight. And I mean massively popular. And it happened to be about 300 yards from where I was living. And so as a result, people I knew were sort of, uh, starting to socialize with people at that radio station and talk about it and stuff. And all of a sudden I got a call from a friend of mine who said, Hey, yeah, you know that radio station? Well, they've got apparently a couple of disc jockeys realized that they spent all their time obsessing about relationships. They went into their program director and said, how about we turn on the phone lines and let people talk about relationships? And the guy said, yeah, great. Uh, but it needs to be a community service show. You need to meet our community service demands. This was a very pirate radio station. So figure out how to do that, and I'll give you midnight Sunday night to 3 a.m. Monday morning. Go ahead. And uh, so in the middle of the night, they were doing this thing, and it, and it quickly developed a cult following. I really wasn't aware of it, but a friend of mine called me and described it to me and said, now they, they need to make it a community service show, so they want you to come on and do a segment called Ask a Surgeon. You'll, you, you'll use big words. It'll be really funny. I was like, what? Why are you why are you calling? This is bizarre. <laughs> what are you talking about? You had but no I, interest at all. Well, no, not that I had no interest. Ringing in my head, and this is the other historical piece. Ringing in my head were the words of one Anthony Fauci, who was coaching up the young physicians at the time to go out and educate and change behavior, because there would be ten million dead if we didn't change people's sexual behaviors and really get them to take AIDS seriously. And uh, this, he was he was chanting this all the time, and and he was one of my heroes then. He's one of my heroes now, and I would bring him down, have him lecture my residents and stuff later. It was, so there's a whole story here that I can barely remember because it just was sort of a footnote at the time. But but it, now in the historical moment, it sort of makes more sense, right? And um, and I thought, all right, well, let's go see what's going on up there. And I was just blown away that here, you know, here were young people coming to radio for their most important health issues, and they had never heard of HIV and AIDS. No one knew what was going on. Wow. And I and and part of the reason was you have to put this back in historical context. In 1984, young people, as far as the culture of America was concerned, weren't having sex. I mean, why would you talk to them? They wait till marriage. What are you, what are you doing? This is bizarre. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm 24 years old. I know what they're up to. Uh, you better talk to them because this is a group where this is going to break out. And so that was my original naive idea. And then I sort of thought, well, what would I have wanted when I was 17, 18? Because there was then, you know, things were still called venereal diseases and everything was shrouded in Latin and mystery. And I thought that that's insane. This is really easy. And there's this very serious thing coming. I'd like to sit down here and just keep answering these questions. And it was one night a week. And I it was on call. I didn't come in. I just kind of go in there, sit down and answer questions. And it moved very quickly to 10 to 1 from midnight to 3 so I could do it more easily. And it was one night a week for 10 years. Uh, and it just something I just I thought I was doing community service. I did it for free. I thought it was interesting. I met interesting people. And it was just something I did. Uh, and then all of a sudden they wanted to put it on five nights a week. And I was like, oh, crap. 
Oh, Jesus. And by the way, the, the week they decided to put it on five nights a week was um, the week my wife got pregnant with triplets. Oh. So it was literally her. It was she that said, no more community service. That's a job. If you're not changing diapers here with me, you're getting paid. So I went in, you know, hat in hand and asked for a payment for this, for being on the radio. It was something I never thought about before. And uh, and then, you know, a few years later, some TV guy showed up and said, we want to do a TV show. And I'm like, well, what's that? How do you do that? That sounds interesting. What do you, what do, you do? And that's how it kind of went. Wow. Wow. So when you were going out and asking for payment, though, did you ever think that it could be potentially a career or was it still Never. a community service thing for you? It, 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 it now was a job because my wife had framed it that way. Mm. Um, but I never, ima- I mean, if you had said, th- if you had said at that moment and that moment would have been about 1992 or 93, something like that. And if you had said, you're going to be doing radio 10 years from now, I would have been, I would have been incredulous and confused. I, I would have been like, what? No, why, why would I be doing that? Why, why keep doing radio that 10 years? Whoa, wow. no. So I didn't, it's just been a, it's been an exploration and adventure. It's had stormy waters and, you know, castles in the sky mm-hmm. and I just keep opening doors and the, the, the conceit has always been try to use media to do good. Uh, I, I had back then, if you take me back to 1983, I was aware that radio was having this massive impact on young people. And I felt it was bad. It was, it was health from a health wise. It was having a mass, it was encouraging drug use. It was encouraging unrestrained sexual activity. I thought maybe this same instrument can, it's, it's had a bad influence. Maybe it could have a good influence if somebody's in there sort of pushing out interesting information. Sure. And and I knew that they wouldn't listen to me in a box like you're seeing me here, but maybe me next to some disc jockeys or some rock bands or something, that, and maybe then they'd listen. And, and that's kind of how the model went. Well, what shocked me was when I was listening to one of the podcasts you were on that you said that you are still a fairly shy and introverted person. I would never know that by yeah. seeing you on TV or see, talking to you here. So yeah. I imagine when you were first starting out, that must have been like a – you must have been even – shyer and you must be less well, more uncomfortable it's it's funny you know constitutional features like that like shyness introvert and extroversion they're they're constitutional right they're the part of the big five personality things and, and what i'm going to say is going to sound bizarre and even more shocking uh, although i had less skill and was insecure because of that i feel exactly the same now <laughs> exactly what, what, what do you mean the same now the same shyness, the same kind of discomfort, the same kind of same feeling. It's the same feeling. It's weird. Wow. Uh, yeah, isn't that weird? Uh, but but because I have a you know a skill set that I've been developing for many years, I, I have more sort of security with it. I guess. Do you think people can? This is talking from my personal experience. As I was younger, I was certainly much more extroverted, and I realized that I became more introverted, maybe an ambivert, because I did a solo travel where I was pretty much by myself for like four or five years. I oh honestly my God. Have, yeah, oh my. I mean, four or five years. I mean, I, what I would basically do, I was like a digital nomad. So I would every three to four months, I would live in a different city, starting with South America and Buenos Aires. And I would obviously meet people and date people and all that stuff. But I didn't really have any close friends because I would go to a city knowing that I was going to leave. And then I would have to go to a different city because of visa or whatever. And that made me uh, turn more into an introvert and more introspective, which is I find it as a good perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as, as as an introvert, just thinking about that kind of a life experience makes me anxious. Mm. No. Interesting. But, and just, but I admire it. I mean, like, ooh, that'd be something. Wow, I wonder if I could pull that off. Probably not. And so yeah. you have an extrovert to be able to pull that off. Yeah, I, mean, I, I certainly went the other way, I guess. But do you think? an introvert like yourself could turn into an extrovert? Well, it, it's not that you, you really can't change your constitutional features, right? Personality f- features are generally fixed. Mm. You can modify and deal with them and integrate them in other ways, just exactly what you're describing, right? Okay. You're still, your, your constitution is still sort of, I'm an extrovert, but I've, I've adopted a more introverted sort of, uh, uh, what should we call it, process to it. Mm. Gotcha. Uh, 
I, and I'm the same way. I'm an introvert and I've adopted an extroverted sort of process to this, a way of managing that introversion. But the, but the constitutional quality is just still there. That's why it feels the same, even though I have all these skills that helps me appear more or be more sort of out there. Yeah. And, and as now for you having so much experience, or at least maybe when you first started, did you see yourself as uh, thinking more about as a personality in terms of, okay, is this going to resonate with the audience? Or did you put yourself more as a, as a doctor? Because it's Strict a hard balance, right? No. Well, yes. Uh, strictly doctor, 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 doctor. Cause I, I was, I, I had like three careers in medicine going simultaneously. I was doing outpatient. I was, I was teaching through medical departments. I was teaching through psychiatry. I started running a medical department, a psychiatric hospital. Then I rendered, ended up running their addiction services. I had an outpatient medical practice and I had an inpatient and intensive care medical practice. This was back when internists could do everything. And I did everything. And I would do it from five in the morning to 10 at night. And, and I'm extremely grateful for those years of experience because as a result, I've seen everything. I've just seen everything. There's nothing I haven't mm. seen and dealt with. And, and I have this incredibly rich experience that I now I want to share. Uh, and, and in turn, and nobody's getting that experience anymore. Everything is very, very siloed in medicine. It, it's kind of bothering me because you, you just have a different set of a different way of thinking, a different judgment when you, you know, when you've seen all the psychiatric spectrum, you've seen medical issues, you, you're working with death and dying all the time. You've seen intensive care medicine and struggled all night, you know, keeping people alive on a ventilator. That, that, that's an experience that can't be replaced. And, you know, people are getting any one of those, but not all of those in one, one career. So I had all that going on and, and I was very, 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 very serious about medicine. I thought it was, the, I thought I was doing something terribly important. So I didn't let anything else I was doing adulterate that. So it was years later, uh, now may maybe years into MTV and certainly, well, two things, I guess. Uh, I, I, so I was very resistant. I, I, I didn't use my real name. I didn't, I was on the radio. I didn't really want people to know I did it. I was, it was all very secretive for me. Um, uh, but as the MTV thing came along and it became more of a public thing, it was my wife that started pounding on me like, you've got to pay attention to how you look and how you look at the camera and what you buy, your dress, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, 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 no I can't be bothered with that. I, it was like really, it was almost insulting. Like, no, 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 no. I've got more important things to do. And one, I remember one day she sat down and um, she goes, you know, we had a co-host. I don't, I don't know what episodes you looked at, but Diane Farr was our co-host for a long time. And uh, she goes, look at Diane Farr. Look how she looks. Look how she looks at the camera. And I thought, oh, 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 there is something there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So a light bulb went off. I still didn't do anything for years. And then Corolla, when I started doing radio with him, would always beat on me. I mean, for, I, and it took me years. It took him years for me to pay attention that he was doing improv and I had to improv with him. And so if I ever said the word no, because I had a, because there was something serious medical I was, you know, was intending to deliver, he would become furious because in improv, you never say no. Right. And so it took years and years and years to, um, to, to, to start to pay attention. And I, and once I did pay attention, I thought, oh yeah, these people are all right. I'm, I'm kind of has silly of me not to pay attention. I have this platform and I should be using it to do good things and I should try to maximize that. And then around 2010, 2011, I was doing so much media that I thought, you know, you practice medicine 25 years, you've, you've done your time. Maybe it's time to really kind of focus on media for a while and see what you can do with it. And and that's when I started just doing outpatient medicine and, and mm. uh, stopped doing the addiction services, stopped doing psychiatry and stuff. And that's where I've been since. Well, it's a tough balance because your first priority, just because giving wrong advice is there's such a high consequence, especially for the people that you're dealing with, like addiction with opium and relationships, that it's probably a very difficult balance to try to improv with someone like Adam Carolla, who's like the complete opposite of you, right? I mean, it's a good dynamic, but... But he appreciates what I'm trying to do. He understands that, you know, I'm trying to do something and... And, and, it, and he, I, I've come to learn over the years that it's the entertainment and the people that know how to make television and make radio. That's what gives me access 
Yes. They, that gives me access to an audience that I, it's not me, it's them that gives me access. And then I can, you know, talk, talk to these people. Um, there's something else you're saying about the, oh, the, yeah, I, I always try to help people under, make sure people understand that this, these are all educational. These are not, it's not really advice. This is sort of education. This is framing things. Here's how we approach things like this. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you what to do unless somebody's actively suicidal and I'm calling the local cops or something, but, but generally it's like, here's, here, here's how you should approach this. Yeah. The interesting thing I, uh, just cause I, before the call, I don't know if I said on air or on or off air, but my mom is a nurse. My cousin's a doctor. Like I come from that medical background. The thing that I've noticed is that the people that have built their careers around just helping people, especially yourself during the day, you're, you're with patients. And then during the night, you're also helping other people. And it's, probably a little difficult to, you know, especially for with you having kids as well, because you're constantly taking care of people. So how do you find the time to take care of yourself? Well, you're, you're right. You do get depleted. Um, there's probably multiple layers to that, 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 that question. Um, I've always worked out. I've always, I just, I'm just, I have to do it. I, I just, there was about a 10 year period where I stopped working out. I did not feel good during that time. And I've just, I, even if it's just 20 minutes a day, I always do something. And, and I listen to educational podcasts and things. And, and so I, I, I just, I, somehow I managed to find that time. I, I just can't live without it. Um, the harder question is how do you stay replete to be able to, you know, deal with your, have a marriage and deal with your kids and things like that. And, and that back when I was really overworking, that was rough. Mm. I don't know how they all put up with, put it put up with me, but it was, it's very, very tough. Now the other issue is, the issue of being a caretaker and giving. Um, it, it is the ultimate meaning in it, humans create meaning from other people and they create meaning uh, from leading a certain kind of life. And, uh, you know, Aristotle pointed this out. He said, you know, service is essentially he said service is the, you know, the way people get to eudaimonia, which is a certain kind of fulfillment and happiness. But he said some things that people, some things that people seem to leave out these days, which is you have to have techne, skill, you have to have phronesis, wisdom. And he listed a couple of things that you have to develop before you can meaningfully be able to serve other people. So it's not just ladling soup in a, in a homeless shelter, which is good, but it's not as satisfying to have a skill that you can offer somebody. And and one on one is much more impactful for the human than, you know, you know, like, and you know, giving giving to the world. And that's great. It's important. I mean, Bill Gates is doing important stuff, but it won't be as fulfilling to him as if he could just give to one person. So this ability to have something to offer to other people is is extremely valuable. And, and I'm very grateful to be able to do it and have that skill. And I'm sure your family members would say the same thing. I actually think I overdid it. I actually was like gluttonous on giving, giving, giving till I had very little left for myself. Um, and I did go to therapy for many, many, many years to balance that out. And I, I went primarily because I was having a lot of anxiety and panic, but, but the conceit in my head was, well, I'm dealing with all these drug addicts. I got to clean up my own shit in order to be able to manage these addicts properly. And yes, that was very true. That was mm. very true. Yeah. Well, what fascinates me is that you're able to just talk about all this stuff while being able to quote Aristotle. So you're clearly a studier of different philosophy systems. Um, are you, are you, have you gone deep into Stoic philosophy and, and learning that I, system? I, I am responsible for Ryan Holiday getting into Stoicism. Are you aware you're of kidding. that? I had I'm, no idea. Yeah. I ran, I was doing a little presentation. He was a college newspaper editor. He, he, came, he just came up to me and he said, Hey, what are you reading? And I said, well, right now, uh, right now I'm reading this thing called the Enchiridion by a guy named Epictetus. And I think it's interesting. And that was it. <laughs> That's now Ryan Holiday. Wow. <clears throat> He's a good friend. Have you interviewed him on this? Uh, I, I haven't yet. Him. You, it'd be perfect for your mm. pod. You can get him in here. He'll, he'll come in a millisecond <clears throat> and I can give you his contact if you want. But uh, so, yeah, I, I stoicism is, is I'm more of a of a polymath when it comes to, to I, I, I have a favorite um, philosophical podcast called you. Um, oh, shoot. I have to look it up for you. I, I, this is part I was complaining to you about the aging brain beforehand. This, <laughs> this is part of that aging brain stuff. No worries. We'll link it up. <clears throat> the partially examined life. Okay. <clears throat> 
really good podcast. And because of them, I'm just sort of more interested in many, many different philosophies. Um, so I sort of, um, uh, I sort of pull what I need together and, and it's funny. I become, I become, uh, more fascinated with one. It's it, it, as I go through my life, one philosophy predominates over another. It's weird. You know, huh. things that I was like, I was t totally dismissive of Hegel and all of a sudden I'm finding like, wow, the historical moment, I'm starting to like think about his philosophy a lot now. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, stoicism for me particularly helped as I was traveling because at least from yeah. what I know, it helps people stay more balanced when things get really difficult, which probably was a really great service to you. Uh, what are some of the other philosophies that have helped you as you've, as you described just, just, just now in terms of the different ways that you've had in your life? Uh, you know, I, I'm such a neurobiologist, uh, and you know, I'm so deep in psychological and interpersonal dynamic processes that that's the stuff that's actually helped me. And, and really what philosophy does for me is it, it makes me step back and look at bigger picture issues and sort of the whys rather than the what and hows. And it, 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 it's not so much something that I use every day. I, I would say it, it, mm. it's fat helps me, I guess it more helps me deal with, you know, history and, and history and politics in the world. I, I think that's more where I use philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. I think similar for me too. It's not an everyday thing, but it's almost like having a council of mentors that you can rely on when specific things happen in your life that you can say, Oh, like what would this person do? What, what are the quotes that I can refer well, back like, to? Like, like right now, I, I feel like we're sort of caught in a struggle between a Hobbesian view of the world and a Rousseauian view of the world. And I, I am a particular, um, I have particular disdain for Rousseau uh, as a- You may need to uh, elaborate just for people that don't know. Yeah. I don't even know, actually. So Hobbes, Hobbes was a British philosopher around the times of the Armada who he developed a, a philosophy about human beings that, uh, this is around social constructs primarily we're talking about. They had, each of them had many, many different other philosophies in other areas of our lives, but we're talking about social constructs. That uh, the human lives in a state of nature, which is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, which is accurate, <laughs> which is true. And it's because we have formed social, we are social beings and it's our social ne networks and, and support systems that, and communications and ne technologies. That's what, why humans are here. That's why humans survive. That's why humans thrive. Uh, Rousseau believed that uh, making a social contract is what ruined us. And that man in a state of nature is uh, the, he called like the something native, the kind native or something. Uh, and that we would just be living perfectly, pulling fruit off the vine, having sex when we wanted to, reproducing. It's just, just a completely. Very Epicurean. Never, it never existed in this history of human development. Uh, but uh, the French Revolution was fought because of Rousseau, essentially. And I feel like. Uh, there's a similar wind to blow on these days, and it always goes to terrible places historically, really bad. And Rousseau himself, the ad hominem piece about Rousseau, he was an awful human being. I mean, he could not have been a more awful human being. He dragged around this, one, in spite of espousing the wonder of how lovely humans are and everything, he had a concubine, this woman he dragged around for 30 years, impregnated her five times, forced her to drop the kids off on a, the stairs of an orphanage each time, and went on about his life. Late in his life, became acutely paranoid of his friends Voltaire and Diderot, uh, and really was actively delusional. So he just a horrible, horrible, horrible guy. But uh, but but a brilliant, brilliant person, and dangerous as a result. Interesting. That's fascinating. I, I'll definitely need to uh, dig into that a little bit more. But I mean, it's it's a good example of this idea of uh, you know you got all of these guys that we admire from Marcus Aurelius or Aristotle, but when you look at their everyday lives, I imagine they were doing things that we probably would not approve of just because <laughs> there was slaves, there was like wars, yeah. there was all these right. different things that were happening. And right. it's, it's interesting looking at the modern day and age, which is, you know, we have to have to cancel culture that's happening right now where you send the wrong message and someone gets their entire career canceled and removed from the face of this planet. Whereas if you look at the historical context, like we were able to separate the artist from the person and what they were able to bring in terms of value into the world. What are your thoughts around that, especially with things that are happening in this modern world? 
study the French Revolution. We have been here before. This we are we are. I, although the issue was more about the government uh, or the monarchy than the social fabric of the day, it was the same stuff, mm-hmm. and it, it it goes bad. And the people that put people up on the guillotine end up on the guillotine, and then they end up on the guillotine. That's how the mob works. And if you notice in the cancel culture, people, the groups start eating themselves. This is how study your French Revolution. If you don't want to go down that path, it was a catastrophe. And let's not forget that it not only did it not work, it ended up with Napoleon. And this is and, you know, you can say what you will about Machiavelli. Machiavelli, you know, although he wrote The Prince, he actually believed that a republic was the best form of human government. You know, he's famous for The Prince, but he didn't like that form of government. But he did make the point that whenever these he he described these same kinds of phenomenon we're dealing with today. And he says what happens is it either totally unravels or a strong man steps in a prince. And I I, I urge us to pull back, pull Mm. back. We're, We're a little bit too much on the further end right now, right? It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not good. It's not, it doesn't end well. Uh, there's yeah. different, the better way to do this and the American system, the American, uh, the, the philosophy of government is the one that solved this problem. Uh, and don't throw it's, it's, it can, it can allow us to thrive again if we, if we, uh, allow it to function. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm in the process of going through the Genghis Khan, uh, oh. biography and it's, it's, What's that? Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah, I mean, it, to me, to me, it's 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 there's, there's some fascination around it because obviously he's he's obviously a conqueror and someone that was a savage, right? Yet he, when compared to Alexander the King, or I forget there was another one. Basically, all of them were killed by family members, their own family members, or their own followers. And Genghis Khan apparently was. Uh, someone that was admired and someone that was so close to family members that uh, I think no one wrote about him for 50 years after he passed just because they really wanted to keep that sacred. And he was uh, the, one of the longest chapters of the first English book, The Canterbury Tales, just because of how admired he was, despite all the things that uh, that he's done. And it's probably good contrast to, to what's happening today. It's It's a bit is, is it interesting how when you open up history and really examine it, it's so different than the mythological gloss that we all have for these different historical periods? Absolutely. Uh, my, my first blush with that was um, Abraham Lincoln. I, you know, I started you know, because I went to I went to a really fine liberal arts college and a liberal arts education has been under attack for a couple decades now. And I'm telling you, there's a difference between a liberal arts education and a really fine liberal arts education. If you have a really fine one, you will never stop learning. You'll never stop reading. That's the nature of a real liberal arts education. So once um, I started, you know, taking deeper breaths, you know, instead of, you know, struggling to get through my days, you know, from, like I said, five in the morning to 10 at night, um, I started reading again. And the first thing I did, I said, oh, that guy on the penny, I wonder who he actually is. You know, I wonder what the person is there. And I started ranking, reading Lincoln biographies and I've read dozens of them now and that was uh, the scales fell from my eyes for him as they have many 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 times since for other historical figures and other historical moments interesting interesting yeah it's it's it is i went down maybe a very dangerous rabbit hole recently as well is before i ran into genghis khan which is mein Kampf and yeah. um of, of hitler obviously and it's uh I got it like a very footnote, which is like a lot of the things that he wrote were not accurate. So it, it's, I'd be curious to know like how well, some of these, how accurate some of these are versus what we know today. Yeah, I, I would say that the, the thing about Mein Kampf and Hitler that people don't do enough of is really examine that moment from the perspective of an average German. I mean, this is the thing that that people are, I hope they'll start to think about, especially with all the stuff we're dealing with now in our country. It's like, it, it happened in Germany. It happened amongst the most rational, stable, uh, technologically advanced. It, it, those people were persuaded by this shithead. Uh, what, what, it could happen anywhere. And you, you pay attention to what they were thinking. I knew some some Germans who 
were less than apologetic about Hitler and, and about their support of Hitler at the time. Mm-hmm. And they went, look, I was a teenager. He built soccer stadiums. The, everyone had jobs. What, what are we supposed to think? The, they were building and cars. And, you know, it was the average person was benefiting markedly from what this guy was doing. So, of course, we supported him. There it is. There mm-hmm. it is. Really be careful. It can happen, yeah. to, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, there's a pattern certainly when a, when a nation or a community struggles, the people that dictators like that or fascists definitely are they're, they're drawn to that power and people are able to accept it just because from like a Maslow's heart of needs, people want to eat, people well, want shelter. It, yeah, it's also that they were coming out of a pretty, when there's chaos and anarchy, that's when these guys step in. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah that's how it works. So anybody who wants anarchy now, you're, you're making a huge mistake, mm. making a big error. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'd regret is not going deeper into history in university. I mean, I'd love to get your opinion on this because you may have a conflicting opinion just because of how much the institutions and, you know, especially medical school, how much that's really given to you just because of how uh, your career has fostered from that. But these day and age where everything is going online, where yeah. universities are still accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars from students without yeah. the social experience or really interactive experience. Where do you stand on that, just given your personal career well, with this? I, I, if, I, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, I, I, the way I think of it is I, if my children were applying to college now, I would approach it very differently, very differently. It, then I was all about best school, best school, best school, best school. And they did it. They achieved that. And they had great experiences. But it wasn't the same experience I had. And now would not be the same experience even they had, which was now seven or eight years ago. And uh, it's uh, actually heartbreaking to me. It breaks my heart because the, the, the experience that was so vital and so vivid and so transformational in my life, I'm not – I think it – unless you're in STEM – uh, and then you might as well go to MIT or Caltech. I don't think you're getting the same intellectual rigor that that I got. And if you're going to MIT and Caltech, you're you're going to be not doing history and philosophy, right? And that's a that's a huge blind spot that's going to be left behind. Uh, now, the fact that that I had decent, uh, well, excellent liberal arts, general education, it, the, the little stuff I was exposed to, even though it was very weak in history and philosophy exposed, I knew it was weak then and exposed me enough to catapult me to study that stuff in my adult life. And I have the, you know, analytical skills and the reading skills to be able to do that because of a liberal arts education and I've enjoyed it. So the fact that it, the fact that I didn't get it in college doesn't bother me at all. It's, it's the, the, the ability to go do it on my own is what I got from college. And that's what I've been doing ever since. What do you recommend to parents or people or students that are now under this phase right now? Do you, I mean, because the thing is, it's not like great alternatives that have existed that is set up for something like this. Well, I, I would say that I don't think the, I think the value of the brand educations, you know, Ivy League and that kind of stuff is going to drop dramatically, dramatically. So it doesn't, what do, it, so it doesn't matter so much where you go as much as what you get from it. And I would, I would, I would be looking at cost efficiency if I were a parent now. I mean, what is the most cost effective way to do this and make sure that my student gets reading, writing, analytical skills? And I think junior colleges are a great way to start. And then a couple of years at a university, go do that. That's a much more cost efficient way to do it. And don't worry about the name on the diploma so much. Worry more about the courses you pursue and, and grab them actively rather than going to a a brand school and uh, being somewhat passive, you know, as you move through and just sort of, you know, maybe not getting even the same education as you would if you would go actively ap- after it at a second or third tier school. Yeah. Yeah. The, the great alternative, like one good alternative that I saw was done by Adam Braun. And he started a nonprofit called Pencils of Promise and he started Mission You After, which focuses really on like the future careers like data science, AI, engineering, and what they do is there's no upfront cost, right? So yeah. you, the idea is after two or three years, they'll give you a pool of different companies that they can hire from. And when you do get hired, they'll take a cut of your initial salary. So 
It's mm. almost, it's like a guaranteed commission based process versus an is upfront it, zero guarantee. Is it, is it an online course? No, I think they have a, uh, I think there's online components to it, but they were actually yeah. acquired by WeWork. Yeah. So to me, that's, that's the equivalent of, uh, maybe a hundred years ago, you know, technical training and mechanics or cars, you know, I, I, I think this is the new world is that rather than just having technical skills like carpentry and car mechanics, we're going to have other technical skills that are highly intellectual for which there will be training for extremely good jobs. And I think a lot of people will opt for that. Uh, I think the, the, the idea of, you know, I, I mean, why we go to college, what we go for it for is going to evolve dramatically. Yeah, the uh, there was an interesting point by Mark Cuban, I believe, in an interview where he was talking about the fact that when everything does get automated from uh, from from law to almost on our daily lives, from a university perspective, just kind of take it back to full circle. One of the most valuable things that we can learn as students would be things like liberal arts and philosophy, where creativity is going to be your differentiator and understanding the ethics of AI are going to be a huge value and potentially a, a yeah. career in itself. Yeah. So it would be like going to these colleges that, that it's they would be essentially reading the great works and yeah. having symposiums on the great works. It, it's back that that's all the way back to classical liberal arts education. I fully endorse that. And then anybody else on other tracks will be tracked into technical skills like you're describing or professional skills, law, medicine, psychology, that kind of stuff. Uh, and and that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Definitely. So I want to take it more into love and relationships and sex, just because this is a, a huge topic that you go on. Um, I'm going to relate it to a personal story for myself. So I'm back in Montreal and I haven't been back in a while, but I recently saw an ex that I haven't seen in about seven, eight years. She's in a long term relationship. It isn't anything like that. But do you think exes can be friends? Well, you, you can't in the first six months. You, you got it's like it's like trying to chip on your drug of choice, right? You can't do that. Uh, that that's that's a not a reasonable thing to do. And men typically have more trouble for reasons that are not exactly obvious to me, um, being motivated to and being flexible enough to uh, maintain friendships. Though they do, they can, but they don't. They tend not to be motivated to do it. Women are often motivated to do it. They're like, "Hey, there's a reason I was in a relationship with this person. I like this person. Why do I want to lose them as a friend?" Right. And men, we kind of want to go back into our cave. It's a very weird impulse we have. Um, but yeah, of course you can't be, uh, but you gotta, you know, you gotta watch your boundaries, right? Cause it's easy for those boundaries to spill if you're not careful, which is why whoever you're involved with now may have an issue with this. Right. Um, and, and, uh, you know, appreciate that person for what it was that you liked about them. Why is it that men have a more difficult time? Is it cause we're more physical? Like we are more physical, but, but I, I, you know, when you, when you ask you know, why when it comes to motivational systems, uh, it doesn't always bear fruit to think logically because motivational systems are not logical. They're just there. And, and our motivational systems are not as geared towards sustaining the friendship. Uh, and it's, and I would argue that it's a, it, you know, we can pass judgment on it and we can take call and we be, you know, say the female motivational system is clearly superior. So I mean, why, why don't we want to be friendly with somebody yeah. that we're very close to, but we're just, we just, we, if for some, we sort of recoil from it, we're not motivated for it. It, it probably, okay. If I were going to you put on my evolutionary psychology hat, I mean, probably it was more to our advantage to get the hell out of there and get, get our genetic material somewhere else and not spend time worrying about this that we know are no longer sharing our oh, genetic. Interesting. I don't know if you saw like a, the, uh, the film explained, uh, like a series on Netflix where they were talking about how humans are, we're all, I think they were more treated as like chimpanzees and apes as our closest species, but it was more like bonobos, which are very polygamous animals. One, one base pair can change that. You know what I mean? So, so this, uh -huh. those, those are those are cherry picking. That's very spurious to go. Oh, we're close to the bonobo because we we share you know everything but two hundred base pairs instead of everything but three hundred base pairs when it comes to the chimpanzees. The right base pair changes that whole 
that whole social structure. Sure. We clearly are not like the bonobos. We clearly are closer to the chimpanzees. We clearly are. The the logic with it. The... Look, it's a, it's a, to try to make those giant. We had a common ancestor. We are not related to them. We had a common ancestor, and, and we differ by the chimpanzee by about three hundred base pairs. You differ from a woman by an entire chromosome. Okay. Mm. Millions of base pairs. So it, these these comparisons start to break down if you get too literal with them. Yeah. Well, the point that we we're making was, you know, religion, all that stuff was man-made. And that because the bonobos, which may be true or not, the idea was that human beings were also meant to be more polygamous. But it seems like with men becoming the more physical characters, that they're the ones that maybe are more let polygamous me, versus let, women. Let, well, of course, that's true because the, the women has to invest so much more into the reproductive process, right? They, they are, they are, their life is, you know, 20 percent of women died in childbirth, right? I mean, that's wow. through history, maybe more like 50 percent. So they, they are much, the, the investment is much more serious to them. Here's one thing about bonobos that I will tell you makes us different than bonobos. Bonobos do not get sexually transmitted diseases. Throughout human history, sexually transmitted diseases killed you. Many, whether you got chlamydia or gonorrhea and pelvic inflammatory disease or syphilis or uh, later in history, HIV, humans develop disease from sexual contact. So our some, at least some, if not all of our sexual mores are built on that fact. If you're raising a teenager, you're it's, you know, 1100 A.D., you're raising a teenager and you know what those impulses are and you know if he or she caves into it. They could die, die of pregnancy, die of syphilis. You're going to say, hey, don't do that. That's bad. Mm. That's, that's, that's where that comes from. And do you think the fear of getting a transmitted disease overcomes the impulse of us wanting to reproduce with multiple partners? No, but, no, but it causes us to have parenting and religious systems that, that bear down on us from a young age to try to shape that motivation. Right. So... With that gone, though, how does that evolve for future humans that as soon as that look, as soon as we develop the birth control pill and antibiotics, right? You, you got to remember, antibiotics had as much an impact as hormonal contraceptives, maybe more. We immediately there was a sexual revolution. Immediately, people started having more sex. Uh, that was the 1970s. And we are now still navigating how to, you know, how to how to how to create a new social order. Uh, and immediately a big disease stepped in that uh, slapped everybody down, AIDS. So, you know, there's, there's a back and forth to this, both socially and biologically. Yeah, I mean, to add to that, it's uh, as, as I think I was talking about the uh, Moran Surf, the new neuroscientist, where he was talking about the fact that human beings are just going to live longer, uh, just given the advancement of technology that's and science. A, that, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other. You're, now you're talking about monogamy and marriage and things like that, and that's a that's a bigger topic. The one thing I would just say to that is, what gets lost in that argument is, marriages are designed to build a family and to raise children, and people don't even think about that when they're getting married anymore. It's like mm -hmm. you you you're trying to create a fam hopefully a multi generational family structure within which optimizes the rearing and performance of children. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. Now, maybe some people won't do that. And there are maybe there'll be variations on that theme, but uh, optimally, it's a it's a unit used throughout human history to optimize child rearing and provide a social network of support, the the larger family system. So people are cared for. Yeah. In this day and age, you're saying it's not the same case. It seems like most people, just... people abandon that and don't look at that. It's very satisfying when you think that way. It's very satisfying when you look at your wife and go, we're building a life and a structure here that is more than just the two of us. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And you're saying, oh, it's just a piece of paper. Yes. Every contract is just a piece of paper. It's the only it's the only contract socially you sign in your life. It's the only social yeah. contract there is a marriage. And, and it's designed to motivate people to stay together, build that system I was talking about. Yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to know because uh you know, before I was telling you about the fact that I was constantly traveling three to four months out of the year. And one thing that I've started to kind of meld into, I'm sure you know, like the attachment theory of like the secure, anxious, uh, avoidant. And I was certainly more the avoidant type. And I think I saw the idea of depending on someone as, a, as, as like a weakness. And it's something I've been trying to get over 
especially I, I've had like business partners and stuff, but it's, it's yeah, I'm going to read uh, Pia Melody's book, uh, overcoming or facing, I think it's facing love addiction or overcoming love addiction. And you're the opposite of the love addict. And, and she yes. talks about love avoidance in, in that book. And I think it would help you to read that book. Well, can you give a summary of just people that are going through something similar where they're so independent uh, yeah, that we have four basic styles in attachment. So in other words, there's genetics, there's the environment, and between the genetic, genetics and the environment is something called attachment. And attachment is how we are cared for in our first two years for sure and five years ultimately of life. And what we do in our interconnectivity with our mom primarily. Mm. And this is a bodily-based, highly neurobiological process that is uh, dependent on the attunement of the mom uh, and the genetic makeup of the baby. Uh, and it results in the ability either to form secure attachments in our life with people that will help us not just build relationships, but build our capacity for emotional regulation. Attachment is the basic instrument of emotional regulation. And you can, you know, there are excesses and no one's perfect as a parent. And of course, they bring their own attachment stuff to the, to the game. And some people become disorganized. Their attachment is a very chaotic, disorganized experience. So that when they're around in closeness, they can't trust it. They feel ex rather than being soothed and sort of connected, they're, they're chaotic and accelerated. You can be avoidant where you feel like you're going to be consumed somehow by a love object, literally, literally swallowed up if you get into the sort of psychoanalytic end of this. Uh, and there's, there's a, there's a, what's another one called? I forget what it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not avoidant. It's, uh, anxious, anxious attachment. I think you're right. Yeah. Which is, we, there's anxious avoidant. I think anxious. Anyway, the point is that there, there, there are uh, other attachments where you're, you're excessively, you know, clingy to people. There are ones when you're excessively pushing things away. <laughs> And this is our attachment style. And you, you, it is uh, things we work on to change in psychotherapy. A really good emotionally focused therapy over time changes your attachment interconnectivity. Uh, and you can change it in your life, too, by, you know, how you relate to other people. And uh, as you're saying, change your outlook. Don't be avoidant. Try to get close. Be trusting. Uh, and and I, I would argue that the, the primary way to do that is to develop relationships with people that you're not attracted to. So let me break that down a little bit. Uh, people don't spend any time, you re rarely hear people talking about where do attractions come from, right? Uh, Schopenhauer said, man may will what he wants. Actually, Eisenhower, uh, I Einstein quoted Schopenhauer, man may do what he wants, he just can't will what he wants. In other words, what you want is not something you can easily change. Uh, and so you may want to be around certain kinds of people. We we have attractions to people. Where do attractions come from? Well, attractions actually come from trauma and childhood and unfinished business and our attachment experiences. And so we will always find ourselves sort of recapitulating the, the kinds of relationships of the past. Hang out with somebody who's a little different. Hang out with somebody you wouldn't normally hang out with. And, and somebody who's paying attention, who will listen to you and see how that person experiences you and listen to that experience and coming back to you. And I promise you that will change how you see yourself and it will change. It has the potential to change some of your attachment styles. So this is for, for a man to be able to do that. You're saying it's going to be a little bit more difficult to bring it to full circle. Well, not romantic. This cannot, not, romantic. Okay. not allowed to be a romantic thing. Uh, if you will, romance has another whole layer of crazy. <laughs> But just in terms of somebody, like, you know, you're like, hey, I'd like to go talk to that person. Or I'd like to hang with that person. Um, not, not the ones you'd usually, somebody you kind of find interesting, but you're not sort of attracted to would be sort of the, the zone you want to you want to look at. Somebody who's different, but yes. but intriguing to you. And, and and tell them about yourself and see how they they experience you. And you will change as a result. The, the, the self is an interpersonal construct. If you went out, if you were a feral child and left in the woods forever, you would not come out with a developed self. You would not be emotionally regulated. I would argue you wouldn't even have consciousness. And it, the, the, it's intersubjective that gives us all of our meanings about who we are. Hmm. Now, is there some truth? Because uh, you were talking about a lot of the ways that we're attracted to people come from childhood. Uh, yeah. I think I've read this somewhere where I don't know if there's a truth to this, which is are men attracted to women from romantically that are that remind them of their mothers and then for for females I mean, for their dads i mean that's a little bit just so um 
there, there are, for sure there are attachment elements that have to be similar because there has to be a fittedness, right? There's sort of a weird fittedness we get into when we're in romantic relationships. So, so to some extent that's true. The, the really crazy piece is that if your mother was or your father was extra super abusive and abandonment abandoning, you will be attracted to extra super abusive abandoning the dudes. That definitely happens. So I'm all the time, you know, coaching people up if they've had an abusive or abandoning past from their parents. If you're super, if you feel lightning bolts, you're a perfect instrument. Your brain and body is a perfect instrument. So if you're lightning bolts attracted, I, I don't care what how that person presents. I guarantee you they will abandon and abuse eventually. David Buss, that's the name I was just looking for here. David, David Buss, Buss yes. is a very famous evolutionary psychologist. And... Um, he he would say uh, that the way we evolved in the savanna, the female would primarily be motivated to look for resources and stability to have the ability to raise a child safely and effectively. So resources and st- and men, he would say, are looking primarily for fecundity and genetic uh, fittedness. Yeah. So you look, we're looking for good genes. And the ability to deliver a child, they're looking for the ability to create an environment where the child can thrive, and, and where they can be safe. And you got to remember, when a woman is there's, when a woman is pregnant, they are vulnerable. Mm. And so those motivate again. This is back to motivational systems. People don't think enough about motivational systems. They're in there operating in our heads. We don't have to cave into them. We don't have to give to them. But to pretend they're not there. They'll get you. <laughs> they'll find their way through. It's like addiction. They'll they'll come out. But you can acknowledge them, use them, shape them, push in different directions. But uh, if you ignore it, it will it will find its way into behavior. Um, and yeah, re- resources are a major motivation. And, and uh, you know, there's lots and lots of literature out there on you know what women find attractive, and it's very different than men. And they have and they have sort of different systems operating. They have, you know, sometimes they are looking for genetic fittedness at you know, certain times in the month. And sometimes they're looking for somebody nice and able to nest. It, it, and, some, and women are different from one another. I mean, just to make generalities about this gets a little dicey. Yeah, I think, I think you said in a podcast where it, for, for women, it's, they look for competency for, for men. Well, women find that very attractive. Attractive, that yeah. Competency is is. I, I think men do too, though. Uh, I think competency generally is a, is a uh, is a really uh, cool quality that I think we all would find it attractive. And do you think that shifts over time? Because competency in a man, let's say, even five hundred or thousand years ago, was being able to hunt down a boar, create fire, right. and feed the family. Right. Whereas this day and right. age, it might be someone exactly. that's a com- computer engineer that created a billion dollar startup. So it's well, it, does that he, shift he, over time? Oh, of course. But okay. but I think competency now is more um, capacity in I, – I, I think about – you know, when I, when I think about competency, I think about, you know, being able to uh, run uh, a resuscitation in a busy emergency room and keep it cool and know exactly what to do. Or if now if we dial it back a thousand years, competency would be able to, you know – protect this castle in the middle of a chaotic or something you know it's, it feels to me more like something in action that it, it mm. that that's when competency really steps in and and becomes attractive i think it certainly seems to shift over time i'm not sure if you're familiar with uh james nestor he wrote a book called breath it just recently came out because i think it was on joe rogan as well called threat uh breath breath i remember yeah. hearing about this and what what was his deal uh, well, he, he wrote, he was a free diver, he's a journalist, but he wrote, wrote a lot about why breath is so important and how that dates back into how the shape of our uh, face has evolved over time, whereas kind of the pre-human species had perfect teeth. Humans are the only ones that have crooked teeth. And part of that is because of the modern diet. When like the fire became invented, we started to chew softer food and soup and rice and all these things where our mouth have become smaller over time. So it's coming longer and skinnier, which yeah. fundamentally has shaped different face, uh, faces over the, even the past 400 years. So I bring that up because I guess it would mean that females and males, we've just learned to find, like we're very adaptable in terms of what makes us feel attracted to someone and probably goes around with uh, ethnics, right? Like white males were like the big thing in Hollywood and they were the only ones that had faces up on the screens. Whereas now it's, 
more of the minorities that are getting some more attention. And uh, it seems like it's a very adaptable thing that humans can learn what to feel attracted to. Uh, a- absolutely. I, I, I just I, I was reacting to the word learn. Um, learn. Okay. Because that's a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit specific. It, it, it's something because attractions, again, are built on motivational systems and motivational systems are, are complicated. Yes, <laughs> uh, they don't. They're not strictly a, a learning paradigm. Uh, but I do agree with your general construct. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, uh, Dr. Drew, I know you're cut on time, so I want to make sure that um, the audience members, first of all, learn where they can find you your social media handles, all that. Before we do, uh, we usually end the interview with one specific and actionable step the audience members can take after listening to this episode. Something that can help them, I don't know, gain more confidence, help them uh, feel better, help them with their relationships, anything that you feel would be relevant in this day and age. I I have two things. Um, And one is read a biography about a major historical figure that you're interested in. Read it. And in fact, I'll recommend one. Read, that's pertinent to our time. Read the uh, pre- the current biography of uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, you want to? There, there's a period of American history uh, after the Civil War that uh, we have blinded ourselves to because it's so horrible, it's so awful that we we just sort of pushed it away. I think uh, as something we don't really want to look at. Uh, Frederick Douglass's biography brings that all to life, and he's a major historical figure in the United States and should be up up, up on every uh, the lexicon of, of the of the founding fathers humbly. Uh, he certainly should be the status of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and and then my other piece of advice is um, do what I said about finding somebody that's different than you and sit and tell you tell them about yourself and see what they say. Listen to it. Take it. Down. Not, not romantically. Not romantically. To make sure you're <laughs> <laughs> Men, we're looking at you. Not the opposite sex either. Mm. Right? Don't don't. It can be this. In fact, same sex probably better. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I know you also mentioned about French Revolution. Do you have any books that come to mind that people can read about the French Revolution? Um, I think I would keep it simple. If you if you not because it's a very complicated landscape yes. of history, you might just want to listen to some podcast about it, you know, uh, uh, rather than try to dig into the many, many, many volume, you know, billions of gallons of ink that have been spilled. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I went down a rabbit hole on Napoleon for a while and mm, that doesn't really give you that. Uh, mm, you know, I'm wondering if you read about Marie Antoinette, it might help you kind of understand it, but I, I'd say this in podcasts, you know, just, just get, get into, you know, once the Jacobins and then the Sans Culottes and then the, the second and third um, Republic get going, you, you'll get a sense of how what a mess it was. Gotcha. And where can people find you online? Uh, so I do. I try to do streams most days. If you go to drdrew.com or drdrew.tv or YouTube slash drdrew, I'm I'm have interesting guests, and I just sort of update what's going on with COVID, which we didn't even discuss, which was refreshing. Thank you. Yes, uh, I know that. So, I know. I can't even handle it. Trust me. I know. Yeah. Uh, but I try to make sense of it and keep people from getting overly anxious and freaked out about it. And then uh, I talk to you know Alex Berenson and people that have alternative views on it, so we can kind of try to shape our our. It's so hard to figure out what's going on. You know, the the press is completely unreliable now. Uh, And uh, I do a podcast with Adam Carolla most days, so he and I are still together. And I do this thing called uh, Dr. Drew After Dark at your mom's house, which is is very popular right now. So check it all out, drdrew.com. We've got it all there. 